Well, last Sunday, last Sunday I told you that the book of Daniel has 12 chapters. The, the first six chapters are wonderful stories that highlight the power of God, the integrity of men, the conviction of young men. And then the second seven, six chapters, 7 through 12, they um, uh, describe revelations, heavy revelations, uh, dreams, and things that would come in the future, things that are even about to pass soon. One of those things that is about to pass soon was the, the dream that the king had. One day a king goes to bed and he's thinking, what's going to happen after I, um, after I die? What's going to happen to this great kingdom of Babylon? What's going to happen? So he has this crazy dream and in the morning he gets up and he can't remember the dream. Has that ever happened to you? You, you, you dream something and you say, what, it was, what did I dream? It was so good or it was so bad. And so he calls all his wise men to come and to, you know, they thought, to interpret the dream. These guys were astrologers and magicians and counselors and liars and all kinds of men and women in the mix. So they come and they say, yes, king, tell us your dream, we'll interpret it. And he says, no, no, I've got a problem. I don't remember what I dreamt, so you need to tell me my dream. And then interpret it. So they well, I, we don't know that. So he says, okay, I'm going to kill you if you don't tell me my dream. Luckily, Daniel wasn't there. And he found out that he was going to get killed because he was in the group of counselors, the Chaldean, uh, the Chaldean counselors. So Daniel goes and asks the king, give me some time. I will go to my God. He did, and God gave him Nebuchadnezzar's same dream and the interpretation. So he goes up there and says, look, you, you dreamt a huge statue, um, 90 feet high, 9 feet wide, and the head is made out of gold, and the, and the, the chest was made out of silver, and then bronze, and then uh, iron, and then the feet were mixed iron and clay. And I saw a huge stone a mountain cut out by, by, by a huge hand, and then that stone crashed and bursted the feet. And Daniel explained to him that his was a Babylonic kingdom, and then the other kingdoms, the Greek uh, kingdom, the Roman kingdom, and then uh, the split kingdoms were the legs, and then today we're living in the time of the clay and the iron, when the, when the countries don't have peace like iron and clay do not mix. And that stone that's going to come is the mountain or the second coming of Jesus Christ that's just going to come and just poof everything. And so Daniel sees those things from 7 to 12 chapters. But the story that uh, I've been telling you are the first six chapters, and they're awesome. We talked about Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We talked about the writing on the wall last Sunday about King Belshazzar and how that hand came out and wrote on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Uparsin, which means your kingdom has been judged. Your kingdom has been destroyed. You have been weighed, weighed on the scales, and you do not... Uh, give the weight so your kingdom is going to be destroyed. And so that night, the Medes and the Persians come in and destroy Belshazzar, or they kill him, and then Dar Darius takes over the kingdom. And we start our story right, right there um, in a little bit, but I'm going to talk about the pit of lions or closed mouths. I'm going to read in the book of Hebrews. Can anybody say praise the Lord? Because I'm going to take you to the 11th chapter of Hebrews first. This is called the heroes of the Bible. I don't know who it was that said that they want their children, they want their children's heroes to be biblical heroes and not Superman, Spider-Man, and the four turtles, or I don't know if those are even alive still today. And, and, and then much less, you want posters of Jennifer Lopez on the wall of your 17-year-old son. You'll have problems there. Or any other of those stars who are usually naked. You don't want those people on the wall. You want the, your children's heroes, your young people's heroes, to be real heroes. And in the 11th chapter we have heroes of faith. And this is the chapter called the faith chapter. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders received a good report. By faith, and then it makes a list, Abraham, 
Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Noah, Moses, Samson, David, and many others listed in the 11th chapter of, he of Hebrews. Each one of them has a story of faith. Now, what is faith? Let me make it really simple. Faith is just simply believing God. That's it. Faith is believing the promises of God. You don't have to be a theologian. Patrick, Pastor Patrick talked about the mustard seed faith. You don't even need a lot of faith. It's just believing God. If God says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and leave their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will heal their lands, I will forgive their sins. When God says something, we need to believe it. That's faith, believing God, as simple as it is, childlike. And so I pick up in the, 20, in the 30, 32nd chapter. What else can I say, says the writer to the Hebrews in this 11th chapter? There isn't enough time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Their faith helped them conquer kingdoms. And because they did right, God made promises to them. They closed the, the jaws of lions and put out raging fires and escaped from the swords of their enemies. Although they were weak, they were given the strength and power to chase foreign armies away. That's what faith does. Faith is huge. In fact, if you don't have faith, you cannot please God. Because they that draw close to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So when you have faith, that makes God smile. That makes God happy. God wants us to have faith in Him so He could fulfill His promises in us. We win. We win. I read the back of the book and we win. There's no reason why you should be head down, depressed. Have faith. Believe God. If the whole world's not believing God, you believe God. If God said it, so, somebody says, somebody said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And everybody clapped and I said, shut up. God said it. And that settles it whether you believe it or not. That's faith. So each one of these men and women mentioned in this chapter have awesome stories. Today, we're just going to take the lions. And, and before I keep preaching here, I want to I show you something. So when I say lions now, I want you to get... The concentration of the ferocity, the violence, the rage, the hunger pangs that just make them explode to tackle animals twice their size and just bring them down. So when we, when we hear about shutting the mouth or the jaws of lions, there's, there's one in, in Judges 14, 5, and 6. It says, as Samson and his parents reached the vineyards of Timnah, a fierce young lion suddenly roared and attacked Samson. But the Lord's Spirit took control of Samson and with his bare hands, imagine trying to fight one of those without gloves. With his bare hands, he tore the lion apart as though it had been a young goat. His parents didn't know what he had done, and he didn't tell him. In, in 1 Samuel, it says, But David told him, told the king, Your majesty, I take care of my father's sheep. And when one of them is dragged off by a lion or a bear, I go after it. This is crazy. He goes after the lion with a food in his mouth, a little lamb in his mouth. I go after it and beat the wild animal until it lets go. Let's the sheep go. If the wild animal turns and attacks me, I grab it by the throat and kill it. That's, that's little David. But with the Spirit of God. Sir, I have killed lions and bears that way. And I can kill this worthless Philistine. He shouldn't have made fun 
of the army of the living God. And then Benaiah in 2 Samuel, Benaiah, the son of Jehodiah, these guys, they should just call, call him Fred and Mark for crying out loud, was brave man from Kabzil who did some amazing things. He killed two of Moab's best fighters, and on a snowy day, he went down into a pit and killed a lion. So in the Bible, we find when the Spirit of God comes over people and they literally, a man kills a lion. The story today is different. It has to do with lions. But I'm, I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about integrity, about living upright, and how that does not eliminate that you will be persecuted that you will be made fun of, that you will be criticized. In fact, you may be criticized more for trying to live right, not going with the flow, being the only one who stands. The book of Daniel shows this over and over. Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the only ones who did not stand, who made a difference. Daniel, who said, I will not eat of the meat offered to the king's idols. I will not. He felt convicted in his heart, and he... He determined in his heart not to be um, contaminated by the king's meat offered to idols. So Daniel is a book of standalones. Daniel is a book that teaches us that whether everybody thinks it's right or wrong, and the peer pressure is just overwhelming at school, to smoke, to look at, to drink, to dress, to whatever it is. There's a lot of peer pressure. And I think that God is looking for people who will have a superior spirit and who will stand on a rock and say, no, at the end of the day, with Christ I win. With God I win. So, you know, you've heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den, but have you heard the story surrounding it? What, what, why did they cast Daniel in the pit? Here we go. Darius divided his kingdom into 120 states and placed a governor in charge of each one. In order to make sure that his government was run properly, Darius put three other officials in charge of the governors. One of these officials was Daniel. Do the math with me. 120 governors. And then three officials above the 120. So that's 40 per official. Daniel was one of the top three. So there are 123 top officials, Daniel being one of them. The reason the king put him there was so that they would protect him and run his government if effectively. There's some things we can learn from people who are not Christians and that is um, organization, structure. Um, there's people who don't have the Spirit of God, who don't know the Bible, don't know God, yet they, they get to work on time, and they don't leave early, and they're consistent, and they're disciplined. We need to learn from those people. What good is it if you speak in tongues, you roll around and flip-flop all over the place, and then at work you're known for the person that gets there late and doesn't do their job and takes 10 minutes after lunch and, and, and is buying boots while you're supposed to be working. Thank you, this side over here. Because this side over here, I guess they do that because they were like... You see, there's things we can learn from the organization and structure of this king. And, and uh, the Lord gave me a message in these three days. The Lord gave me a bunch of messages. One of them I'm going to preach is about ordering your steps in his word. But I'm, it's, that's going to be very practical. Some of us are very spiritual but very disorganized. And it doesn't match with your spirituality. Jesus, Jesus loves you, the rapture, Jesus coming on stuff. Well, why don't you clean up your mess at work? Stuff like that, for example. Okay? And he did his work so much better, this is talking about Daniel now, than the other governors and officials that the king decided to let him govern the whole kingdom. So all of a sudden, you know, there's this competition here. There's, you know, the 120, were, they were good. They were like up, up in the kings, in the upper echelons of the kingdom. And then above 
them there was three but Daniel distinguished himself Daniel was excellent in spirit and superior that the king thought man this guy is just above everybody and he was a foreigner he had been brought in the captivity from Babylon from Judah and he was a, a Hebrew child but God gave him grace don't tell me that God can't use you in this evil world don't tell me, say, well, it's just too much pressure out there, pastor. Out there, no, you, my friends, is, Daniel was able to maintain his testimony at the lowest part, walking as a prisoner. And then when he was in charge of the entire kingdom, Daniel always loved God. Always. What am I saying? I'm trying to encourage you that our, you may be feeling pressure to do and to act certain ways God will always reward those who honor him always the other men tried to find something wrong so now the jealousy sets in and these 122 120 plus the two that used to be at the level of Daniel now they the conspiracy starts now the energy is no longer placed where the king wanted it to protect him, to govern the kingdom, delegate authority, have things run right. I mean, this, this king was smart doing that. Now their focus has changed. Let me tell you something. As you try to do good for God the best that you can, I don't even compare one-tenth to Daniel. I look up at Daniel and say, whoa, one day when I grow up, I want to be like that. I'm running out of time. See what I mean? And there's going to be people always, especially when God shows favor to you, when God gives you gifts, when, when everything you touch seems to turn to gold. And, and my father taught me many things a few days before he died, 36 years ago. I was, I was 25 years old. Those of you good in math can now figure out my age. And he, he told me one thing. He showed me. He said, Bring, get your Bible. And he, he said, open the Bible to, to Ecclesiastes 4.4. 4. He says, I, I, want you, I want you to see this verse. He taught, he taught it to me in Spanish. Esto también es vanidad. Toda buena, toda buena obra del hombre despierta la envidia en su prójimo. Every good work of a man will awaken his uh, prójimo, his neighbor's um, jealousy. When God blesses you, expect people when you when you are trying to do the best and you have favor expect people to talk and to criticize and to bring you down expect it we're like crabs sometimes crabs are always pulling down on you have you ever seen a, a, bu a bucket of of crabs you don't even need a lid on it because when one's about to go out the other ones bring it down they're good mexicans I, I heard somebody say this morning, we're about, we want to buy a house and everything. God bless you. When you see somebody coming in with a brand new car. Huh, I mean, how come they go to Tijuana so much? Well, they're, not, they're crossing more than churros. You see what I mean? And, and when, when, when God gives somebody a beautiful wife, praise God. Or, or a handsome husband, you, you praise God. You will always find people trying to bring you down. And the easiest thing is to, is to, is to talk about people, to, to split words and to make people look certain ways and to put words in people's mouth. That is happening here with Daniel. He has 122 people with power, with authority, with access to the king, with, with, with uh, delegated authority, with money. They're not going to the office to see what, how they can protect Darius. And they're going to the office to see how they can destroy Daniel but they could not accuse him of anything wrong because he was honest and faithful and did everything he was supposed to do you're talking what is called a testimony a testimony is your life is your written life in in, in vivo in person it's who you are it's character it's doing the right thing Daniel wasn't sinless, only Christ is sinless. But Daniel was, he was a, a man of integrity. Finally, they said one to another. These guys were having meetings. 
How can they say one to another without meeting? They, they're having meetings against Daniel. We will never be able to bring any charge against Daniel unless it has to do with his religion. If you want a little more solid theology, read the King James Version. I'm using the common English version here so that everybody can understand. But, but it talks about it, it has to do something with his God. So watch what they do. They all went to the king and said, Your Majesty, we hope you live forever. That was just like saying, Paz de Cristo. <laughs> all of your officials, liars, there's at least one who's not doing this. You see? All of your officials, leaders, advisors, and governors agree that you should make a law forbidding anyone to pray to any god or human except for you for the next 30 days. Everyone who disobeys this law must be thrown into a pit of lions. There's a problem here because first of all they're appealing to the man's pride. No pun intended with the pride of lions we're going to get to. If you didn't go to English class that day, I forgive you. That was a good place to laugh and say, oh, pastor, you're so smart. But you are still in fasting mode, I guess. They appeal to his pride. And the, the dumbest thing, they said, look, we all got together. And it wasn't to advance your kingdom. It's not to buy more property or to conquer. It's not to, fi to fix the, the channels of water or the, or the canals or the wells. It's not. We just came up with this, this genius thing. The king says, yes, nobody should pray to any god or any man except you for the next 30 days. And the judge, and the, the king bought it. it. It appealed to his pride. said, well, yeah, it's pretty good. They're making him a god when he's not a god. Uh, you'll be surprised at what lengths people will go who want to destroy you. It might be an office worker. It might be a mother-in-law. It might be a daughter-in-law. It might be a son-in-law. It might be a, 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 a cook a competitor of your business, it might be a neighbor, it might be a neighboring church. It, it's, uh, there's, it can happen any place. It happened to Daniel. The length that people will go. They invent this plot. And the reason they came up with this will be revealed in a second. So Darius they said, order this to be written and then sign it so it cannot be changed just as no written law of the Medes and Persians can be changed. The Medes and the Persians had this thing in their legislation that it was called the law of the Medes and the Persians. And it was a law written in stone. Once the king signed a law, even if he said, you know, I'm going to kill my baby, he could not go back. That law was set in stone. And these men are using that legislation, that part of their constitution, if you would, that part of their law to go after one man whom they could not find one, one mistake in. So King Darius made the law and had it written down. Now Daniel heard about the law. Of course, he wasn't in on all of this. He didn't go with the king to say, make this law of course not and I want you to notice in verse 10 the calmness and tranquility of Daniel because when you know that God is with you all of hell and the gates of hell can come after you and God is with you and if God is with you who can be against you if God is with you, no weapon formed against you will prosper. I'm telling you, you need to get, take your sonship and your daughtership and say, I am a child of God. And because I am a child of God, I get his protection, his blessings, his favor. Yes, I get his corrections and his discipline. We always talk about that. But today I want to encourage you that your daddy's got your back. Your dad is on your side. And don't now, don't get me wrong. Say, okay, well, he's on my side. I can do whatever I want. It's like the big mother. You know what I mean, right? Who got called to the principal's office because her little son was misbehaving and being a brat at school. So he's sitting in the office there shaking and his mom walks in. I told you she was a big sister. 
she walks in. And the little boy thinking that he, now I've had the principal, the teacher, now my mom. The mom goes up there and says, what happened to my child? You know, or if it was a Mexican, like, ¿Qué pasó con mi hijo? ¿Qué está you know. <laughs> and she got in a fight with the principal. And she started yelling at the teacher. And she said, I'm going to take him. Oh, he's my son. I'm here to protect him. And, and they didn't want to cause a fight, so they go, go ahead. So the little boy's walking with his mom to the car saying, thank you, mama. Okay. And then he gets in the car. Over here, it was justification. The ride home was sanctification. And when he got home, it's the beatification. You see what I mean? So when I'm telling you your dad's going to, your father's going to protect you, he's going to protect you while you honor him, of course. Watch Daniel in verse 10. Daniel heard about the law, but when he returned home, he went upstairs and prayed in front of the window that faced Jerusalem in the same way that he had always done. He knelt down in prayer three times a day, giving thanks to God. Nothing's changed except everything. He didn't run in a panic. Jesus! Jesus wasn't born yet, but let's just say. He didn't go, let's go look for the pastor. They're trying to kill me. I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. No, he's tranquil. He's at peace. He walks in there. You and I need to learn to pray before the storm, during the storm, and after the storm. That, that sets us a cut above. That gives you a superior spirit. That places you in a level of winning all the time. I tell the ministers, I tell them, when, when you're going to preach, don't pray to preach. I was in Colombia the other day, and I, I was giving a seminar on preaching. And they're all, Pastor, because when I go to Colombia, just things weird happen over the good things, powerful things. I don't know why. I think I've told you this. My trips to Colombia, um, God just pours like double anointing on me. I, I preach the same thing here. You guys go, yeah, praise God and all this stuff. Let's go to lunch. Those people, they get healed and stuff. And I was, and so there's about 20 messages that I they started preaching in Colombia since 1995 or six, and those are on YouTube, and those are still reverberating in the souls of little kids who were little kids, and now they're pastors, and they communicate with me, and so they wanted to know where do you get these messages from? Como entró la araña, Marta, Marta, a bunch of others, and so I told them, don't pre, don't go pray when you're gonna preach. God, give me a message. Your messages, the good ones, come from a continual life of prayer. They come as, an, they come as a result of, as a consequence of. They are fruit of a life of prayer. You, you don't pray because you're going to preach. You pray because you love God. You pray because three times a day He faced Jerusalem and He would intercede for His people who were bound and captive in Babylon. He would remember the temple and he would pray. And this stopped nothing. He knew the edict. He knew the law. He knew the law of the Medes and the Persians. He knew that, but he prayed all the time. The men who had spoken to the king watched Daniel and saw him praying to his, to his God for help. You're going to have people watching you. When your boss brings you to his office and everybody says, ooh, what did you do? And you walk out with a big smile and a raise. You need to know there's going to be a shift in that office. You need to know there's going to be people, well, what do you know? She, it's because she dresses that way. Or it's because he brought him cookies or pumpkins or whatever. I don't know what you bring up. They kept watching him. They went back to the king. In Greek, this is called chismosos. They went back to the king and said, didn't you make a law that forbids anyone to pray to any god or human except you for the next 30 days? See, Daniel did not say, well, God, you know my heart. And, you know, 30 days, 30 days. And then I don't have to pray when these guys are watching. I can pray like at 2 in the morning. Or, you know, we'll get around this, Lord. I love you, but I don't want to die. And it was already established how he was going to die in the pit of the lion's den. You saw the lion's. They don't say, excuse me, can you hand me a napkin and a fork? No, no, they crush bones. 
And when you take, when you take a pride of lions with all that shut up violence and hunger and the reason there was a den of lions was precisely to throw prisoners, to throw bad people, to throw the enemies of the king, to have them tortured by the hungry lion. Don't think they gave these lions breakfast every day, breakfast. Well, if it was breakfast, if it was a bad guy, th that was there to punish, to torture. And Daniel knew that. And Daniel didn't say, and look, the the book of Daniel talks to us about the little things. I will not contaminate. What's wrong with eating a hamburger? It just went below that Buddha there. Big deal. That thing's dead. It doesn't matter. It does matter. When, when I'm talking, if you want to live in a superior spirit of character and integrity, it's in the details. And Daniel could have easily said, God, you know I pray. You know I love you. You know it's three times a day. We're going to cut it for 30 days. Just one month, God. Give me, give me, a, give me a month off. No, he continued doing it. So these guys go back. Didn't you make a law that forbids for the next 30 days? And doesn't the law say that everyone who disobeys it will be thrown to a pit of lions? Yes, that's the law I made, the king agreed. And just like all written laws of Medes and Persians, it cannot be changed. The men then told the king, that Jew named Daniel, by this time, the, the king didn't even know why they were doing it. That, you know, we, need, we in authority need to also find out when people come and try to manipulate us. You didn't have discernment. Why, the, why are you doing this? Why, why, do you, why do you want to pray for me for 30 days? And why the lions? What's wrong with you guys? What's wrong? I could just hear the diary. What's wrong with you? I think he said it that way. You guys aren't going to laugh at all this morning, huh? You, that's what happens when, when we fast. You get so spiritual. You guys are kind of making me sick right now. But I love you. Yeah, that's a lie I made. And just like all written laws, I cannot be changed. The men told you, that Jew Daniel, who was brought here as a captive, refuses to obey you or the law that you ordered to be written. And he still prays to his God three times a day, consistent, persistent, insistent prayer. The king was really upset to hear about this. And for the rest of the day, he tried to think how he could save Daniel. He was bamboozled. He was caught up in the plot. He was manipulated. He loved Daniel. Darius knew what happened with the writing on the wall. Darius knew Nebuchadnezzar's dream. These kings were taught in the previous dynasty's um, uh, history. They knew that Daniel was a good guy to have. In fact, he was a great guy to have around. He was an asset to any kingdom. And so the king now is, oh my, why did I sign this? These, these guys got me. And so he tried the rest of the day. He worked hard. Is there any loopholes in the law? Can we find anything? Bring me the lawyers. Bring me the best firm out here. Is there anything I can do to get Daniel off the hook? The king was really upset to hear about this. The rest of the day he tried. At sunset, the men returned. Now, how come these guys aren't working? The time and energy that people consume to try to destroy you is incredible. They come back at sunset. Your majesty, remember that no written law of the Medes and the Persians can be changed, not even by the king. So Darius ordered Daniel to be brought out and thrown into a pit of lions. And as he's, as he's walking over, it's hurting his heart, he says to Daniel, you have been faithful to your God, and I pray that he will rescue you. The King James Version says, your God whom you continually serve, he will save you. Let me tell you something. Daniel's faith bled over into the king. This pagan king who did not know God, who did not know Jesus. He knew Daniel that knew God, but he didn't know him. But when it comes, the push comes to shit. He says, this God that you continually serve. That's the secret there. That's the nugget that you continually serve. You don't just serve him when things are going good. You don't just serve him when things are... You, you serve him when, when 122 of the king kingdom's top men are after you you're gonna serve him you're gonna preach 
You're going to prophesy. You're going to live for God. You're going to pray. If all hell comes against you and that God that you continually serve, Daniel, the king, the pagan king, that's how you get your boss to worship God. That's how you get your neighbor to worship God. Integrity. They know you'll be there. They know you're not going to curse. They know you're not going to steal things. They know the kind of person that you are. He's going to save you. I don't know him, but I know you. That's the light that's supposed to shine. Listen, church, the kingdom of God is not here. This is church where we come to celebrate and have a great time. What a wonderful service. Went a little long because a lot of videos and Mark and stuff. <laughs> you know where the kingdom of God is? It's in your factory where you're there stamping golf balls or whatever you do. If you work there, bring me some. <laughs> Buy them. And here comes the joke. And it skips you because it's getting dirtier, you know. And it goes down the line. And then, boom, it hits the wall. It comes back. Now it's a filthy joke. But you're standing there just hearing it. You're a sister. And you're, you just, it just skips over you. You, you. you just don't get involved with that. And, and just everywhere, every detail. You pray for your food. And not like this. Lord, bless it before they come. <laughs> you don't do that. Neither do you get on your knees and start speaking in tongues in the lunchroom. You're going to be known as the loco, apostoloco. You see? Just be normal. Be consistent. And that faith is going to spill over. They'll know who to go to when they have a problem. They may mock you right now for speaking in tongues. They may mock you for believing in divine healing. But when their baby has cancer, when their mother's very sick, they're going to know who to run to. They're going to say, can your God? I don't know your God, but I know you. I know enough of God through you. Oh, hallelujah. You are faithful and serve your God. Uh, he's he's going to help you out. A stone was rolled over the pit. So, so there goes Daniel. He disappears. Boom. And it's sealed. The King James says the king sealed it with his ring and all of the other. All the other fat guys are they're just fat in my mind. They're all putting their ring in the wax. Sealed. Sealed. But something was strange. We don't hear no hungry lions. There was an ear, eerie silence. I don't hear anything. I don't know, just seal it right now. Maybe they're on a break. All night long, the king could not sleep. He did not eat anything and he would not let anyone come in to entertain him. At daybreak, the king got up and ran to the pit. Man couldn't sleep. The, the King James says, no music, no food, nothing. He was just trying to, what did I do? He was anxious, and he runs out there and says, Daniel, you were faithful and serve your God. Was he able to save you from the lions? What a crazy question. King Darius obviously didn't see my video. What do you mean you run to a pit of hungry lions and then you start talking to the victim that was cast in there? Daniel, was your God able to serve you? But there was enough faith in this king that it spilled over from Daniel that he's using this language. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Do you remember, mm, Beth, do you remember um, the, the queen of Sheba that came over to see Solomon and saw all the great of, of his palace and of his minstrels and of his ministers and the food and everything? You remember? that and then it says when she saw the way Solomon ascended up to worship his God there was left no spirit in her and out of the lips of a pagan woman came out the words blessed be the Lord your God hallelujah hallelujah I'm telling you, this church is going to explode when we can get our bosses to praise God by your life. When we can get our bankers to praise God because of your life. When we go to the gas station and the Holy Ghost floods that gas station because we walk in there not speaking in tongues but with integrity, with light in our eyes. What kind of question, Darius? What kind of question? Has he been able to 
keep you from the lions. And then he hears a voice. I like to picture it like this. Your Majesty. Yeah, yeah, he saved me. What time is it? Danny's kind of, his pillow is the mane of a lion. A step ya. And the lion just, because the Bible says that by faith, they shut the jaws of lions. Let me tell you something. Whatever it is, whatever jaw it is that wants to eat you, whatever, whatever jaws that want to destroy you, whatever mouths that are trying to destroy you, I'm telling you that by faith, by faith, by faith, you can shut the lion's mouth. Your majesty, I hope you live forever because I'm doing good. My God knew that I was innocent and he sent an angel to keep the lions from eating me. Your majesty have never done anything to hurt you. The king was relieved to hear Daniel's voice and he gave orders for him to be taken out of the pit. Daniel's faith in his God had kept him from being harmed. And the king, watch this, the king ordered the men who had brought charges against Daniel to be thrown into the pit. 122, a key line right here please, right here. Right here, alphabetical. A ver, Alberto, and Beto, and Charlie, and David, line up. Where are we going, King? Where's the banquet? No, 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 you don't go banquet. Lions, now banquet. <laughs> Lions are still hungry because they threw something in there they couldn't eat. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he, watch what happens to these guys. He ordered the men who had charged Daniel to be thrown in his pit together with their wives and children. Now it's a family reunion. But before they even reached the bottom, the lions ripped them to pieces. Yes. King Darius then sent this message to all the people of every nation and race in the world. Look at his letter as we close. Maybe a pianist can come up. Here's his letter. Greetings to you all. I command everyone in my kingdom to worship and honor the God of Daniel. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't worship King. Oh, no, no, you're going to do. And where's my God? I don't know. I can see him either, but t talk to Daniel. Now you're going to worship him. You're going to worship him. Doesn't the Bible says that every mouth, every knee, and every mouth shall confess, and every knee shall bow? You, you, you don't want to worship him right now. One day you're going to worship him. It's better to get in now. Every, I command everyone in my kingdom to worship and honor the God of Daniel. He is the living God. The one who lives forever. His power and his kingdom will never end. This is a king. He rescues people and sets them free by working great miracles. Daniel's God has rescued him from the power of the lions. All went well for Daniel while Darius was king and even when Cyrus the Persian ruled. Let me tell you, Daniel lived a great life. Daniel lived in palaces and he wore purple robes. Daniel ate the best food. Just because he decided not to contaminate himself a little bit, God raised him up. Daniel was wealthy. You, you think he didn't give him a raise after this? Lion, the, the king tries to give, I think I'm going to give you a hundred dollar raise here. And Daniel looks at a thousand. Ten thousand. Whatever you want, Daniel. And he sends this letter to everybody proclaiming that Daniel's God. Wouldn't you like people to say, oh, oh, Mary's God, Johnny's church. Yeah, they, you know, those people really, they, 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 yeah, they, I have my church. I had a lady come here a couple times, maybe five or six times. She goes, oh, I have my church. She goes, but at your church, I feel things. God is, don't, don't you want them to say? Now I close, I think I have a picture up here, Jackie, of a, a thought, Jackie. Because... Check to see if Jackie's in the lion's den. I'm not talking about the animals. I'm not talking about that guy. God didn't just save Daniel from that guy. 
he saved him from the real lions, the 122 that wanted to devour him. And God will do that to you and me as long as we are upright with him. Upright with him in everything that we do. You go to the market today as I close. You go to the market today. They give you $20 extra in change. They're wrong. You do not say, Lord, you know, we've been praying for a blessing. Thank you. Now I have got... No, you save somebody's job and give it back. April 15th is coming before you know it. Do your taxes. Do them right. Don't cheat. If, if you find a wallet... What do you, you find a wallet with $600 in it and you only have $4 left for the month and it's the 10th. Do you start speaking in tongues? Oh, shut up, shut up, thank you, Jesus. No, you thief, give it back. And if you notice, there's, there's been people who have done the right thing and then others find out and they start blessing him all kinds. I heard about a man who gave back something that he had found. I don't know what it was. I don't remember what it was. And then somebody started. He got like $400,000 because he returned $400. In everything, in the smallest things, let's live for God and give him honor and glory. We're not perfect, but we can do that. And God will save you from not only those, but from those who want to kill you and destroy you. Let us stand, please.